biblical character. You know, just give him a pass on that. Amen, amen. Luke, the second chapter, no vacancy for Jesus. No vacancy, no room, in other words. Why didn't you say no room? Well, part of it is because I, uh, I've got a story I want to tell you. Back, way back, way back in, when I was in college, I, uh, I was a night clerk at a hotel, 11 to 7 shift, and it was my job to check people in uh, during that time also to audit and take care of the balance of the books. And so one night, uh, 4.30, 5 o'clock, uh, a lady approached and she said, uh, I, I have a room reservation. I said, okay, great. Uh, and then I said, but wait a minute, uh, you'll notice the sign. The sign says, no vacancy. We're full up. She said, well, I've got a room reservation, young man. And I said, okay, when? And she said, like today is December the 9th. And she said, well, it's December the 9th. And I went, uh, can do. She left all hot and bothered, obviously. And I wanted to say to her, I thought later, and I, I wanted to say to her, when you think back, you know, what you would say in that situation, well, you get to be like Jesus. There's no room in our inn for you. Uh, but I didn't. I refrained. Uh, when, when Mary and Joseph came, nowhere. No vacancy. There was a no vacancy sign, so to speak, for them. Let's read about it. In those days, a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that the whole empire should be registered. First registration took place. Look, no vacancy no, for Jesus. You know, things haven't changed in the last 2,000 years. Let's look at, first of all, the first thing we'll see is that Jesus being born in a stable demonstrated, first of all, his humility. Demonstrated his humility. First of all, there is the humility of his lineage, his family line, if you would say. Here's Mary and Joseph. What's the situation with them? Well, they're engaged and she's pregnant. Obviously, she and he are the object of intense gossip and rejection. There they are, <laughs> and they're part of the taxation. Joseph and Mary are part of the taxation process, and they have to go to a nowhere Bethlehem was just a little nothing village five miles outside of Jerusalem. They were totally obscure, totally overlooked by the intelligentsia crowd. But you know what that tells me? God is not looking for the proud and the powerful. God is looking for the poor and the powerless, that he might show his might and that he might show his vision and his strength to the world. He's not looking for those who have accomplished something in their own name. He's looking for those who are available to be used by him. So that's Mary and Joseph. Nothing to offer except that they be used of the Lord. And so comes Jesus, born that evening in a hotel. There's a different word in the Greek for what we would say is hotel. Uh, because at a hotel, you pay for your lodging. At this particular place, you did not pay for your lodging. It was free, but it wasn't much. Basically, it was a house, uh, a shelter. Now, let me put it another way. It really wasn't a house. It was just kind of a shelter that had rooms so that people could come and they could sleep and then they could go on their journey. There was nothing great. There was nothing glamorous. There was nothing comfortable about it except it was a place to land and a place for their animals. That's, so they're going to the poorest of the poor places and they get to the poverty place to stay and even there they don't find anywhere that they can stay. And the innkeeper, the con keeper says, well, um, you can go out here
Acre and are very plentiful uh, in the area of Israel. If you travel around the hillside, you can see caves, just openings in the hills and valleys everywhere. So there, it could have been a cave. Now here's what they did with caves. They, the animals would be taken to a cave that had a large enough offering uh, opening so that it offered shelter. And then inside it would be protection, permanent protection uh, from the elements. Heaven and most glorious palace in all the world, and it would never have compared to how wonderful and glorious it was in heaven. The best that we have to offer here on this earth is poverty compared to what heaven has to offer. So, it was bad to begin with, and it continued to be bad. But it was humble. It was humble. So, here's what Philippians 2 verse 8 says. He, Jesus, he was used to humble surroundings. He was born in humility. Yeah. Born into power, you know, a person of influence. He could have done that, but no. In the council of heaven, in the Trinity, the council was to be born in poverty, to identify with the poor. Now, why is that? Because you see, to be identified with the poor, number one, there are more poor people than there are rich people. Number two, to be born into poverty would mean that he would be able to identify with the poverty of our soul. I mean, how do you feel when, you're, when your life is wiped out? When, when things... He was a young child. the wonderful horse that he has. Look at the glamorous clothes that he wears. Ah, uh, he's great, but I don't know if I could. He's, he's just too rich for my blood. He's too powerful for me. See, by being born in poverty, both the poor could feel like, well, he, he identifies with me. He, he only has one set of clothes like I, like I have. He, he, in fact, Jesus said, uh, the foxes have holes, the birds have their nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. So they saw him as he would sleep outside at night and put his head on a rock as a pillow. They say he's just, he's like, he's like us. So they could identify with that. And the rich could also, because they would say, my goodness, this man could have it so much better, but he chooses not to. I feel like I can talk to him too. So in his poverty, in humbling himself, arrogant, and have a few things that they want to say first, he receives those who are sinners that say, Lord, I need you. I, he doesn't say, now wait a minute. Ah, we're a little bit too busy right now. You get a busy signal, call back later when I have time for you. You know, it, it may be that some of you today, you despise yourself. I hate myself. I hate myself what I am. I hate how I'm living. I hate what I've done. You may just say, my life is a living hell right now. I'm telling you that the Lord Jesus in His, in His humility and in His servant heart and He being the Redeemer of mankind, that hell that you're living in, He can reach down His powerful hand and He can lift you out of it when you cannot lift yourself out of it. You can come to Him even though you despise your life, even though your sins be as scarlet, they can be white as snow, though they be red, you can be saved today. You can be rescued from where you are. Look what it says in Luke 6, verse 17 and 18. It says, The great number of people, they were all around him, Judea and Jerusalem and the seacoast of Tyre and Sidon. They, they just came. They wanted, they wanted to be near Him so they could hear Him. He was so approachable. Today I would say, come to Him. You may say, I can't. Yes, you can. You know. Can't have it until you've done this list of chores and duties. Now, should you do all those things? Uh, yes, you should, but not on Christmas Day while you're opening a present. Because if you do all those, what, what is it? It's not a present. It's not a gift anymore. It's something that you have earned. A gift is not something you earn. 
A gift is something that is given freely with love behind it. And where Jesus was, when he stayed in this inn, this guest room, it was a place of free gift. It was a free gift that was given to all who come. And that's, that's the message of salvation. I've turned him away. Why did not he turn me away? Here's why. He is God and you are not. He is the Son of God. He is the prize above all prize. He is the wonderful Savior. And we judge Him by our own emotions and our own thinking and we can't comprehend it. But over and over from the Old Testament to the New Testament, the Lord proclaims His, un, his unabashed... Um, just Does that make sense? You can't come to Jesus truly and not be changed in your life. It is a free gift. The last thing that we see is this. It is an encouragement to the worst of sinners. The worst of sinners. Does anybody here feel like the worst of sinners? Oh, I can tell you, anyone and everyone can have that feeling at times. This place where he was, was the low. Well, I mean, it was where the animals were. And this is a picture of what can happen to our lives. Have you ever said this about someone? You see that they go off into sin and they're down there and they're living in darkness and they're just doing things that are so diabolical. And maybe, maybe you've witnessed or maybe you know someone like this and you say, they're, they're, they're living like animals. You know, I, you know, I can pull up all kinds of videos. You can too now with security cameras everywhere of how people are just acting like animals as they treat one another. And you see, that's what happens when a Savior is tossed out and we live for ourselves. We, we go off into sin. We, we just live for ourselves and we live in darkness. You see, the stable represents what can happen. Mind and fully in sin can be rescued from the Lord God Almighty. He will lift you up. So, Jesus being born in a stable. Now, who are those who put up the no vacancy sign? Who are those who put up the no vacancy sign? First of all, the government. Government does. Well, back in those days, Herod said to the wise men, tell me where Jesus is so I may worship him. And he was just a lying snake in the grass when he said that. Why did he say that? So he could kill him. He wanted to kill Jesus, the baby Jesus, because he was afraid of the power he might have. And you see, today the government's still the same. Let's get rid of Jesus. We don't want Jesus. Talked about, spoken about from a politician, our government, a person. Wait, do we have Jesus? That just really makes us uncomfortable, you know? Polite society doesn't want to talk about Jesus. There are some things that are more important. There are some things that are just... You know, some people say, well, I don't like to talk about politics and religion. Yeah, I, I just got to tell you, those are two things I love to talk about all the time. <laughs> because uh, you may say, why? Well, they, they can be both of them very exciting at times. But, you know, we don't, it's just, it's just not. So we're going to. Won't call them out. They make a God that won't tell them that they're sinners. They make a God that won't condemn them for their wrongs. They make a God that makes them comfortable. It always, always works that way. A no vacancy sign for Jesus because he kind of upsets my life. And then the merchants. The merchants, no vacancy. It's all about, come on, we're going to sell the Jesus junk in order to make money, but the other stuff is what we're really going to focus on. The merchants, no vacancy, no room for Jesus in the Xmas season. We don't want him. There are excuses that people will use to put a no vacancy sign on their heart. The first one will be this, I am unworthy. 
I'm unworthy. Well, of course we're unworthy. All of us are unworthy. Absolutely. But I'm just so, I'm just so dirty. Oh, I'm just so dirty. Can I remind you that Jesus... dirty and a place where the Son of God should not be the, the manger and the cross but both of them are symbols you can go to the manger and you can see the holiness of Christ and you can go to the cross can put you in a bath of righteousness and wipe your heart clean. No, you're not worthy. But you know what it says in Revelation? Worthy is the Lamb. He is worthy. And you take on His righteousness. You may say, oh, I'm so, I'm so unworthy. There's a, there's a void. There's an emptiness in my soul. I'm glad to hear that. You know what that tells me? There's room. What do we say? No room for Jesus? Yes, there's room. You just said there's an empty void. That means there's an emptiness. A void. A vacancy there. And you can't fill it up with anything or anyone else except Jesus. The second thing would be this. Worldliness. Worldliness. Well, you know, they're just, uh, I, you know, There's just some things I want to do first. You know, my family denied me. I denied myself. And, you know, I'm going through my second childhood now. And, I'm, you know, you know, after the wife and kids and all that, or the, the husband and the kids, you know, I just, I just got tired of being told what to do. And I'm going to, there's just some, some things I want to do first before I leave. it's not of the Lord, okay, it'll leave a scar. Now, the Lord will give you life when you come back to Him. He will definitely give you a newness of life, but there will be a scar. So, turn away from that. There's some things first. Come to Him first and receive life, worldliness. And then the last one would be this, unbelief. Unbelief. Now, Here's what unbelief says. It says one of two things. Now you decide which camp you're in. I can't believe. I cannot believe. Jesus was born of a virgin. I can't believe that stuff. That's just religious talk. I can't believe. He has transformed the whole world. I see the difference that He has made. There's no one that has ever lived like Him, even come close to Him. No one can touch the impact He has made upon history. But I don't say you can't, because you can. You just won't. Or, so you may be in that camp, or you may be in this camp. I can't believe I can't believe that He would want to save me. I'm trash. I'm despicable. I'm, I'm broken. I'm bankrupt. I'm the worst of the worst. I can't believe that He would come to save someone like me. Others, yes, but not me. Not me. I just want to ask you one question. One question. Who is telling you that? Where is that coming from? It's not coming from heaven. It's not coming from the throne room. It's not coming from the cross. It's not coming from this pulpit. Steal, kill, and destroy. Come. Recognize and say, I hear 
where that comes from and that voice is so trembling in my mind and so haunting. I turn to the cross. I turn to the cross. And Jesus, I cry out, forgive me. And he reaches down from the resurrection and he says, come to me, my child. I've always loved you. I've always loved you. Come to me. There's room. There's room. There's not a no vacancy sign. Do an exercise, okay? I want us to go on a journey. Everybody bow their heads and just hang with me, okay? We're going to take a couple of minutes to do something. On this journey, bow your head, close your eyes, settle down. Don't think about what you're going to do, what you've got to do, or what you want to do. Just give me right now. Take a journey from your mind down to your heart. Get on an elevator and go down to your heart spiritually. The Bible says with the heart... Man believes under righteousness. So go, go down to your heart. And the elevator door opens. There's a throne room. Come to church, you know, trying to do, you know, do what I can. But no, there's never been a time when I've said I'm a sinner and I need a Savior. And you call upon the name of the Lord. And you're saying, Jesus, be on the throne of my life. Forgive me, rescue me, change me. I cannot change myself, be my Savior. That means be my King and be on the throne. If you'll do that, my friend, He'll give you a new heart. He'll give you a new life. He'll give you salvation that you can't have on your own. Would you today call upon Him to be saved? All right, you've seen the throne and you know what to do. Softly and tenderly, Jesus is calling, calling for you and for me. See on the portals, he's waiting and watching. for a few moments. I know you've already heard this, but be sure and be back tonight. Six o'clock.